Hello, this is Gary LaRue of Microwave Journal. Welcome to this Rogers webinar showing how millimeter wave PCB antenna measurements can be matched with radar software models presented by John Coonrod and Joey Kellner. Before me, we begin, let me call your attention to a few logistical items. If you'd like to download the presentation slides for reference, you'll find a copy in the window labeled Resource List. We will have time for questions after the presentation. To ask one, just type it in the Q&A window on your screen at any time. Also, we are recording the webinar so you can watch it again and recommend it to colleagues who are not here for this live event. Now let me introduce John and Joey. John is well known, the technical marketing manager for Rogers Advanced Electronic Solutions segment. With some 34 years working in the print and circuit board industry, John is well known and respected for his knowledge of high frequency circuit materials and circuit fabrication, as well as his extensive electrical characterization studies. He chairs the IPC D24C High Frequency Test Methods Task Group. John has a bachelor's in electrical engineering from Arizona State. And Joey Kellner is a senior market segment manager at Rogers. She has more than 20 years industry experience. For the last 15, she's been working in engineering, product management, and marketing roles at Rogers. And in her current role, Joey works with automotive customers to understand and meet their RF material and commercial supply requirements. She has a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from North Carolina State University and an MBA specializing in technology, science, and engineering from Arizona State University. Joey, I'll turn the screen over to you first to start the presentation. All right. Thanks, Gary. Okay, so first I'll go over today's agenda. I'll start off with an overview of some 60 to 80 gigahertz millimeter wave data applications and some of our RF material recommendations. Then I'll turn it over to John Coonrod to get into the, the technical aspects of our presentation. He'll talk about um, insertion loss, copper roughness, and design decay using different test vehicles. Then cover some basic concepts of radiating patch designs that are used at millimeter wave frequencies. Next, we'll talk about some of the PCB fabrication influences on millimeter wave antenna design, as well as some circuit material influences on millimeter wave design. And then uh, we'll conclude it by showing some supporting data for the millimeter wave antenna performance of S11 and anechoic chamber. So to begin, we would like to highlight some typical 60 to 80 gigahertz millimeter wave radar applications that designers might be working on. According to the World Health Organization, globally about 1.3 million people die each year in traffic accidents. Half of those deaths are for vulnerable road users like pedestrians, cyclists, and motorcycle drivers. So to help improve traffic safety, vehicles are incorporating more sensors, including radar sensors, for applications like automatic emergency braking and blind spot detection. Radar sensors are also used inside the cabin for feature, features like child presence detection to help prevent hot car injuries. <clears throat> so as time progresses, governments and NCAP, or new car assessment programs, continue to update and encourage these increased safety features, which are enabled by millimeter wave radar. In addition to safety, radar sensors are being employed to increase vehicle automation as well. So robo-taxis, like I see here on the, the roads in Phoenix, and last mile goods delivery vehicles are being prototyped on the road, utilizing a suite of advanced sensors, including high resolution radar sensors. In addition to utilization of vehicles, uh, these sensors are also contributing to the deployment of smart cities and um, industry 4.0. It's be becoming more common to see traffic radar sensors on city streets, intersections, and highways to improve traffic management. There are also a number of applications within buildings including door opening features, occupant monitoring, and sensors used to activate, activate uh, various functions like lighting or air conditioning. And even within healthcare facilities, millimeter wave radar can be used to monitor patients' vital signs. Robots and cobots utilizing radar are, all, are also employed within factories and logistics terminals, and of course, as well in drones. 
For many of these millimeter wave designs, high performance RF materials are needed to form the antennas and key network between the RF and MIC and the antenna. Two examples are shown to the right. Typically, designers look for excellent electrical properties, which means tightly controlled dielectric constant and very low insertion loss. Those electrical properties must also be stable and reliable over time, temperature, and humidity. And then mechanical properties are also important to ensure the radar sensor's performance over time. Items like robust field strength and tensile properties must be considered. The right RF material building blocks are also needed to support various design types, for example, materials for cap layers on FR4 or materials for multi-layer RF boards or uh, for use in substrate integrated waveguides or SIWs. Overall, Rogers RF Landit portfolio, portfolio provides cost-effective, high-performance, and proven reliable options for RF designers and PCB fabricators. This next slide highlights some of the typical Rogers materials which are used for 60 to 80 gigahertz radar sensors. This isn't a complete list, and every design and application will have unique trade-offs. Uh, Rogers has a global team of experts available to assist you with customized recommendations based on your specific needs. Here I've organized the RF materials shown to show the typical products we would suggest when looking for the highest RF performance and which products we'd suggest for the most cost-sensitive applications. I'll start in the middle with R03003 laminates. This product grade has been used for over a decade in 77 gigahertz auto radar applications due to its stable decay performance, low loss, and outstanding board level reliability. For new designs, Rogers also recommends our RO3003 G2 and CLTE and W laminates. These two sister products are ceramic filled PCFE laminates, the same as traditional RO3003 laminates. Some optimizations have been made to reduce loss, improve decay stability, and improve PCB fabrication. R0303 G2 does not contain any woven glass, and we recommend it for cap layer designs. For multi-layer designs, CLTE MW is a good choice, since it's essentially the same product as R0303 G2, but with woven glass reinforcement. Both products are also available with 9 micron copper foils, which can assist in PCB fabrication to meet tight feature tolerances. For cost-sensitive applications, we recommend our RO4830 and RO4835 low-pro laminates. These materials are made from a hydrocarbon thermoset resin, which processes similarly to FR4 laminates. This approach can minimize the total cost of the radar PCB by reduce, reducing both the price of the RF material and also reducing the PCB fabrication cost. We have tailored options for both automotive and industrial radar. For automotive, we like R0 4830 since it has a design decay closer to the traditional R0 3003 laminate. R0 4835 Low Pro is often used for auto radar as well, and is often found in uh, radar chip suppliers' reference design. Then for industrial radar, we recently launched a special grade designated R0 4835 IND, the IND indicating industrial radar. So during John's presentation, you'll see some measured data on some of these products including RO3003, RO3003 G2, and RO4830. And now I'll turn things back over to John Kingrod to cover today's technical topics. Okay, thank you, Joey. And uh, I'll start off by a, uh, going through a quick uh, overview of insertion loss and some basic concepts. And I'm gonna go through that relatively quick because I think most people uh, watching right now, probably already understand this, but I just want to make sure that uh, the basic concepts are, you know, good because uh, of some of the terms I'm going to be using later on, just uh, making sure everyone understands what I'm saying. So insertion loss, as probably most of you know, is made up of four components of loss. Insertion loss is uh, made up of conductor loss, dielectric loss, radiation loss, and leakage loss. And today we're mostly going to focus, uh, the next few slides anyway, mostly focus on conductor loss and dielectric losses. Radiation loss I'm not going to talk a lot about, and the reason why is because uh, it's uh, rather complicated. There's a lot of dependencies, and it can be design-related, materials-related, frequencies, just a lot of stuff. Uh, I am going to talk about a little bit when we get later in the presentation, we start looking at feed lines and things like that where it applies. But for the basic concepts, I'm going to ignore that because all the data I'm showing is pretty well behaved for radiation. 
and leaky gloss I'm also going to ignore. Um, and then uh, just giving a visual way of looking at these components and how they add up to uh, the total insertion loss. I'm given three charts here, and all three of these charts are uh, using 50 ohm microstrip transmission lines and uh, same material, same everything. The only difference is the substrate is thin for the very far left curve, a little thicker in the middle and thicker to the right. So I'm going to start with the curve in the middle that's using 10 mil thick RO4350B laminate. And again, 50 ohm microstrip transmission line, the thick purple curve is the actual measurement of the circuits, and we're going out to 20 gigahertz on the uh, x-axis. Y-axis is in loss per uh, dB per inch. And you can see the models that we are showing that goes along with the measure data are the thinner uh, curves on the uh, middle chart there, and the green curve is the total loss, insertion loss, and that should match the measure data. And for this example, that's probably close enough. Um, you can see what makes up the uh, total loss, though, is the uh, blue curve and the red curve, and that is blue curve is dielectric loss, red curve is conductor loss. Now, if you look to the left, what you find is the same type of circuit and testing, except it's now on a thinner substrate. And, of course, we had to make a more narrow conductor to maintain 50 ohms. But you can see that the insertion loss increased more, and also the reason it increased more is because the conductor losses are more significant. And that's true. As you go thinner, which is usually needed as you go up to uh, millimeter wave frequencies, usually a thinner laminate is desired for a lot of reasons. Uh, usually thinner is more dominated by the conductor effects. And that means you need to be interested in whatever can affect conductor uh, effects, such as copper surface roughness, which I'll talk about uh, quickly. And then also final plated finishes. They can affect that as well. And I'll talk about that as well. And then the chart to the far right is the same concept, except using a very thick substrate, 30 mils thick. And here you can see the conductor losses red curve are not the dominant um, loss factor. It's actually the blue curve that is the uh, dielectric losses. So in the case of a thicker laminate, it's really the dielectric losses or the dissipation factor that you want to be focused on if you want to improve it. And then for the thinner circuits, it's really conductor effects that you have more interest in. Now, just to give you uh, kind of a real-life example here and just um, – Go a little bit farther on the concept. Here, what I did was test the uh, same transmission line circuits, except now we're using a different material. It's RO 4003C laminate. And what I did was a comparison of bare copper circuits compared to the same circuits with ENIG. ENIG is electrous nickel immersion gold. And also, I did it on thick and thin substrates. And uh, the thick substrate, 20 mil thick, is the difference uh, or the curve, blue curve versus red curve. Blue is bare copper. Red is ENEG, and at uh, 25 gigahertz, we get a difference of about 0.21 dB per inch. That same comparison on a thinner substrate, everything else being the same, is the green curve and the purple curve. Green curve is bare copper, purple curve is with the ENEG, and there we see about a 0.38 difference. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 0.38 dB per inch. So you can see there's a pretty big difference there between a thick circuit and a thin circuit for the effects of conductor loss, and the thinner circuit is more affected by the ENIG, which is affecting the conductor loss. Now, if you would have done the same thing with 60 mil thick, you would find there was very little difference between the bare copper uh, curve and the curve with the ENIG, and that's because a thick laminate such as 60 mils is kind of insensitive to copper effects, but I wouldn't say that completely. It's just less sensitive, let's say. Uh, so anyway, that's something that's actually pretty important, especially dealing with millimeter wave. You've got to realize that uh, as you go up in frequency, normally thinner laminates are desired, and with thinner laminates, they are going to be more sensitive to anything that affects the conductor. So now talking about copper roughness quickly, um, I'm showing a cross-sectional view of a microstrip circuit, and the copper roughness that I'm talking about specifically is the substrate copper interfaces. And uh, here I've kind of exaggerated it and make it uh, look pretty obvious, but... Where it really comes down to where the copper roughness impacts RF performance, it's frequency dependent and, more specifically, skin depth dependent. And what happens is if you look at the, uh, the effects of a circuit due to copper roughness at low frequency, very low frequency, megahertz maybe, you won't see much difference between circuits with rough and smooth copper. As you go up in frequency, once the skin depth gets the same dimension as the copper roughness, that's when the circuit is going to start being more affected 
by the copper surface roughness. And the copper roughness will impact the insertion loss, like we've already seen, with the conductor loss basically being impacted. And also the phase response is going to be impacted. And the reason the phase response is going to be uh, affected is really because uh, rougher copper will slow the wave, and a slower wave is going to be seen as a higher dielectric constant, which also is going to show that as uh, phase response as well. Phase angle is going to increase. So that's a real quick overview of insertion loss and copper roughness. And I would like to kind of drive the point a little bit farther. Here's a really good comparison we did on copper roughness as it relates to phase response. And what we did was years ago we made uh, four different laminates all in the same material. The material is 4 mil LCP, and uh, it was the same lot of material. Everything was the same the best we could. And then we used four different types of copper. We measured these copper types using our uh, laser profilometer. And we understood that very well, made laminates out of them, sent the laminates to the circuit fabricator. They built some simple microstrip circuits for us. We used the microstrip differential phase length test method to evaluate the circuits. And the results on the y-axis are the effective dielectric constant, which is essentially what the wave will see. So as the wave propagates, there's fields in substrate and there's fields in air for microstrip. So the effective dielectric constant is actually that. It's not the dielectric constant of the material. It's the dielectric constant combination of material and air as the wave perceives it. Anyway, uh, x-axis is frequency. And you can see the circuits with uh, the smoothest copper, the red curve, having 0.5 micron RMS roughness, which is pretty smooth. You can see they are reporting the lowest effective dielectric constant. And then as you go rougher, the circuits with uh, the rougher copper green and then rougher again purple, and then the roughest was the circuits uh, with the blue curve. And you can see there's about a 0.3 difference in effective dielectric constant when using the same dielectric. There's nothing, nothing different with the dielectric material itself. This is all due to copper roughness. And essentially, the circuits with the smooth copper the phase velocity is not being slowed very much, and the circuits with the rough copper, blue curve, the roughness is slowing the wave a lot. And just basic electromagnetics tells you that if you extract information and the wave has been slowed, then electromagnetics is going to call that higher decay, and that's why you're seeing these differences in effective dielectric constant. Now, this matters a lot with thin circuits uh, when the copper planes are close together, ground plane, signal plane close together in the case of 4 mil. If you did the same thing on 60 mil, you wouldn't see much difference. You'd see a little difference, but not a lot. Again, this is good to keep in mind because most millimeter wave applications are using thin substrates, and they will be sensitive to the copper effects. Now, another thing to consider is variation due to the copper roughness and other things. So copper that we use and everyone uses in the printed circuit board industry is not perfect for the surface. So the surface roughness will vary from place to place on a sheet of copper or from one sheet to another or lot to lot. That's just normal. That's normal variation. And as the copper varies and it's on the low side, then the DK versus frequency curves I'm showing here, that would be the curves on the lower end of this beta population. DK on the y-axis, frequency on the x-axis. Don't know if you can see this real well, but DK is uh, going from about 2.8 to 3.6. X-axis is going 1 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. And we get a total range of extracted DK, or design DK as we call it, at 77 gigahertz of 0.126. Now the material itself is the 5 mil RL3003 material. This is the material that's been used uh, in the industry a lot for millimeter wave radar, probably the dominant material, I think. And uh, you can see that the variation of 0.126, the number looks a little alarming at first, but in reality, when you stop and think about it, that's actually a pretty good number. And I'll explain that. So our dielectric constant of the material itself is held to a tight tolerance of plus or minus 0.04 for a range of 0.08. So out of that 0.126, just the range of the dielectric constant of the material is 0.08. Now, the rest of that's a combination of the copper roughness varying from batch to batch of copper and also uh, several print circuit board fabrication influences. One thing that's not included in here is final plated finishes and the variations due to that or solder mask. But uh, this is a pretty good number I've given to a lot of designers before, and they said, yes, this is a good number to be using when you're trying to do models to account for uh, sensitivity or variations uh, in performance. Uh, 
Uh, next slide is, if my computer cooperates, okay, there we go. Next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about RO3003G2. Uh, Joey introduced that, and this is a material uh, I'm really happy with. Uh, we developed this material several years ago, and it came from several years of working with the 3003, which does work very good in millimeter wave radar applications, of course. But we also learned a lot in that time frame. And from that learning experience, we have figured out how to optimize the 3003 to be very good in RF performance and friendlier to circuit fabrication for these millimeter wave antenna applications. So what we're looking at here is a comparison of the uh, chart on the left is the same chart I showed on the last slide. So that's the normal variation of the material that's being used right now the most in the industry, the 5 mil 3003 with ED copper. And then on the right is the neural material. This is our 5 mil 3003 G2 laminate, and it does have smoother copper. So with smoother copper, you will naturally have less change due to copper surface variation. Copper surface variation is always going to be there, but with smoother copper, it's just naturally less. So that's one benefit. But we also did several things in formulation to help uh, with consistency of dielectric constant, which, of course, translates to consistency of phase angle. And we also have some things in there that's helpful for doing microvias and a lot of different things for uh, circuit fabrication. So moving on, um, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the test vehicles that are used. We've had the comment several times in the industry that our design DK used in microstrip transmission lines is pretty good, actually. Uh, but we do get different values with a transmission line as compared to a radiating structure. And why is that? And the answer, as usual, is not that simple, but I'll try to walk through it real quick. First off, let me explain uh, what we're doing with these different test vehicles. First off, the uh, microstrip uh, transmission line that I'm showing here is part of the microstrip differential phase length method, and uh, it's using a transmission reflection type of technique. And um, it's really uh, minimally impacted by circuit fabrication. And that's one of the reasons we picked this structure. If you pick something like Grand Co Planar Waveguide or Strip Line or SIW, you can do characterization on that. But unfortunately, those structures are more influenced by normal variations in circuit fabrication. So the microstrip transmission line is pretty clean when it comes to that. And also, it's pretty easy to make an electromagnetic model to compare circuit performance to a model. And uh, that's another good reason to use that. Uh, anyway. That's the uh, differential phase length method, and really all it is is transmission lines are two different lengths made on the exact same panel side by side. They're identical in every way except for physical length. And then you take phase measurements from that. You get the effective DK, and then from the effective DK and understand the dimensions of the circuit very well, you can extract the DK of the material itself versus frequency, and that's what we call design DK. Now, the other test methods and test vehicles, and there are many, now those, the others that are used pretty common are ring resonators, and a more traditional one would be labeled two here, where it's using open-ended feed lines and gap coupling, and then three is a transmission line that I've seen used more in the millimeter wave industry, and I think it's a smarter design just going through and looking how sensitive these two different ring resonator uh, structures are to circuit fabrication influences. So in the case of the ring resonator with the um, gaps and open-ended feed lines on both sides, uh, that can uh, have some issues with circuit fabrication because of the gap and also because of the feed lines and other things. The ring resonator below, that's basically a transmission line with a ring edge coupled to it, that is less impacted than the other ring. And the reason why is because the RF path for the one I have labeled three, which is basically a transmission line, the RF path is uh, continuous. And really what happens is at certain frequencies where that ring will resonate, it sucks energy out of the line. So you have a normal insertion loss curve. And wherever that ring resonates at, you get a dip there. And from that dip, uh, you can figure out what the dielectric constant is. The ring above that has feed lines and gap coupling, the RF path is going through two gaps, and those gaps are varied in circuit fabrication. They're not perfect. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go on. And then finally, the, the uh, press vehicle at the bottom is a series-fed, pretty simple, microstrip series-fed patch antenna. And we would look at the, um, the radiation, oh, I'm sorry, we'd look at the S11 um, uh, resonant dips. 
And uh, this is actually a pretty good test vehicle to use. The reason I would want to use this would be if I'm making a serious fed patch antenna, I would like to have a coupon that I'm testing that is very similar to my most critical part of my radar. And uh, that's normally what you should do. Your test vehicle really should be, uh, again, the most critical part of the circuit that you want to evaluate, in my opinion. Anyway, I thought something would be interesting to do, and what, I, what we did here is we used 5 mil 3003 g 2 which is uh, extremely consistent, and uh, that's part of the formulation. So I know uh, on a panel I see very little difference in dielectric constant from point to point on, a, on one panel. So on one panel I made several different uh, test vehicles, actually the ones I described. And one thing I might kind of explain here, I, I see a typo here, and the title up here saying using 5 mil 3003 G2 laminate with half ounce VLP. It's actually HVLP copper for those of you that know about that. So it's a very smooth copper. Anyway, just comparing the results of these different test vehicles, the transmission line, microstrip transmission line, is this blue curve. And at 77 gigahertz, you can see we're hitting about 3.07 as the extracted dielectric concept from that test vehicle. The ring resonator with the open feed lines and two gaps, that's a little bit lower, 3.35. The ring resonator with a transmission line and a ring coupled to it, that's a little lower again, 3.025. And the series side patch radar, radar ah, radiator, excuse me, <laughs> that's lower again, about 3.018. Um, so there are some differences there, and some of that has to do with length. And what I mean by that is the transmission lines uh, testing and how they do that, it comes out to be um, really across a unit length like inch or something like that. So it's really a one inch type of measurement if you want to look at it that way. And the ring resonator, if you were to stretch that out, you know, and look at the circumference, so to speak, stretched out into linear terms, it's not the same length. If you got the ring resonator to be the same length as the transmission line being evaluated, you would get numbers a lot closer, uh, but still there's going to be a little difference because these gaps, the gap coupling with the ring resonator. In the case of the patch, it does not have a gap. However, the patch is doing something different than the transmission line and the ring resonators. It's actually got very strong fields in a very small area, just right at the edge, edges. And I'll explain a little bit uh, more of that as we go along. But uh, this is something that to keep in mind as you're doing test vehicles and trying to understand how to do millimeter wave um, evaluations on materials. And... Um, one of them, I, I really do like the microstrip differential phase length method just because, again, it's a pretty simple structure. It's not affected by printed circuit board fabrication influence as much and, and things like that. The ring resonators, uh, which a fair amount of customers use, uh, that can be done and is done, uh, but there's more trouble due to circuit fabrication, and as long as that's well understood, that's okay. But uh, in circuit fabrication, they will plate up copper to get the circuit image plated up, and if they do that, uh, and then etch it and get the circuit defined that way, um, you can get differences in that gap. And for the circuit that is gap coupled with feed lines on both sides, that's even more significant because you have two gaps for one thing and also the RF path of going through the two paths. And uh, in this case, the gap coupling can have an influence on the center frequency peak. And with that, it can cause erroneous DK extraction. And then also the gap coupling uh, can be altered by trapezoidal effects. I'll explain that a little bit more as we go along. But essentially, if you look at a cross-sectional view of a transmission line, uh, it's not a perfect rectangle for the signal conductor. It's more trapezoidal shape, and that shape changes from circuit to circuit. And then uh, gap coupling is also affected by copper plating. If the copper plating is thicker on one circuit compared to another circuit that's thinner, the thicker circuit is going to have more coupling and error, and error obviously is a lower effective dielectric constant. That's going to make the resonant frequency shift a little bit. And uh, then finally, the final plate of finishes also have an effect. And the final plate of finishes is actually affecting uh, conductivity in the gap area, which does have an effect on how that gap performs for um, capacitance and everything else you're looking at. Anyway. Um, the through line is really the best way to go, I think, if you want to use a ring resonator. I've done a lot of different models and testing and comparing results to these models, and I found that uh, this, the circuit test vehicle that's least impacted is the microstrip transmission line. That I'm sure of. 
the ring resonator that uses the microstrip transmission line, you just have one ring gap coupled to it, but still a transmission line, that also is less impacted by normal variations in circuit fabrication. Uh, but the other ring resonator I talked about that has the two open feed lines, two gaps, that is more impacted by circuit fabrication. And then, of course, the uh, patch, uh, series-fed patch radiators. That's kind of ideal, I think, if you're actually making a radar with that kind of circuitry on it. That would be a good structure to use as your uh, characterization uh, testing. So uh, let's go ahead and move on. That's kind of a, um, a quick run through of some basic concepts of insertion loss and copper roughness and, and some of the effects on the test vehicle. So now let's look at uh, how a patch element works, a microstrip uh, radiating patch. Again, I'm going to go through the concepts a little quick, uh, mainly because I think most people already know this, but I just want to make sure before I move on to showing some of the details of our testing. So a microstrip patch, that's been used a lot over the years. They, they work quite well. They're quite well known. Um, you get really good performance, especially at microwave frequencies. There's lower frequencies. These perform very well, very consistently, and they're not impacted by circuit fabrication as much at lower frequencies. Higher frequencies with shorter wavelength, that's when these can be more sensitive to slight variations that are normal variations in circuit fabrication. Uh, let's see, let's go on to this. Now, there's different ways to uh, couple the energy from the feed line to the radiating patch, and I'm showing some here. Most of what I see is a, a direct connection, the bottom right, the one that's labeled B, and there's usually some type of transformer or some kind of difference there, mainly because the feed line bringing the energy to the radiating patch is 50 ohms usually, and if you take a 50 ohm line right into a very large patch like that with no compensation, you're going to get a lot of reflected energy, of course, because that's a big difference in impedance. So you're going to get a lot of energy reflected away from the patch, and then you won't have as much energy to radiate off the patch. So uh, these are just different concepts, and each of them have their own uh, you know, benefits, film trade-offs, basically, of uh, the coupling and how it's done. Not really going to get into that much. Um, and then this is a little bit more detail on how these uh, patch radiators work. Normally, I wouldn't say normally, it's common that a quarter-wave impedance transformer is used uh, prior to the patch, and there's a lot of other things that are done to get optimum energy to the patch. That's the bottom line. You're just trying to get as much energy you can to the patch on the transmission side of things, of course. And on the receive side, you want to be very sensitive to receive whatever you can for the patch, of course. Anyway, the uh, picture center to the right there, you see some fringing fields. And these fringing fields are really where the radiation edges are. So you have a lot of energy at a very small area on your circuit right across this edge here, on both edges. And uh, um, because of that, you're going to get something a little different than you would like a transmission line. So a transmission line, if you're trying to look at those fields and extract the dielectric constant, that's going to be over a longer distance. You get more of an average effect and things like that. And here, if you're trying to use this as a test vehicle, like I mentioned a few slides back, you really have having fields very isolated in a specific area of the materials, and that's a little different than the averaging effect you get from the transmission line. That's one thing. Um, but that's probably good enough for that comment, I suppose. Um, we have a test vehicle that we use, and I'm going to show you some results on that from radiation patterns and S11 testing. And it's a pretty simple series fed uh, radiating patch shown here. And I'll give you a little more details as we go along. The, uh, the circuit's basically our test vehicle, and we've been using that more and more. And uh, it's able to be, you know, uh, changed in a lot of different ways. But essentially, if you just look at one patch and how one uh, microstrip patch radiates, uh, there is, um, for radiation patterns anyway, it's really good for having a wide angle radiation pattern in azimuth, excuse me, radiation pattern in azimuth. However, it's usually a narrow angle on the elevation plane. And a lot of times what's done with these designs and what's done on this particular design, you can see these patches are different widths as we go along the length of this uh, series fed patch. And the different widths will actually alter the radiation patterns. And normally what you're trying to do here is you're trying to adjust the radiation patterns of uh, all these different patches to be what you want, basically. So if you want more elevation, you might 
have uh, different um, concerns on each one of these patches and how they add up to give you the radiation pattern that you want. Uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, circuit fabrication issues. Let's talk about that some now. In circuit fabrication, it's like everything in engineering, you have normal variations, and uh, one of them is circuit definition. So as the circuit fabricators makes the circuit and the circuit uh, images, they typically will plate copper up and then etch away what they don't want. So the copper is plated up and then etched away. However, just normal to the etching process, 90-degree uh, corners, either inside or outside, they're not perfectly 90 degrees. They're usually kind of rounded or radius or something like that. Now, the fabricator has some control over that. It depends on a lot of things, uh, and that's something you do want to talk to your fabricator about. And I'll show a little more information on that. But uh, generally speaking, uh, that can be a concern depending on how much that radius is and how much it varies from the design. And it's going to vary from one circuit to another, too. It's not going to be perfect just due to normal variation of making a circuit. And then the next one down where I'm talking about the conductor shape, that's the cross-sectional view. I probably should have worded that a little different. So generally, the conductor shape is not rectangular in a cross-sectional view, and it's more trapezoidal. And uh, I'll show a little bit of information on that and why that can uh, make some differences on the antenna performance. And then under etching is something I ran into several times, and that can be very problematic. And what I mean by under etching is the circuit fabricator, of course, they want to make these circuits at high volume as fast as they can. So if they go through the etcher faster, you under etch the circuit and you get more of a trapezoidal shape. And sometimes you even have little copper dendrites, little particles alongside the conductor. And at microwave frequencies, low frequencies, that's not that big of a deal, actually, believe it or not. In millimeter wave frequencies, that's a really big deal. Um, so that's something to be mindful of. And again, talk with the fabricator because they can usually control that pretty well as long as they're mindful of it. And then copper plating thickness variation, I'll talk about that. And also final plating finishes. So let's move on and start talking about some of this stuff. So here I'm showing a view of our design and then in reality what came out of that after we had circuits made. And for this type of uh, design, you uh, you do have these neural conductors that are acting as impedance transformers, and it's between the different patches, too. So really what you get is I would call it a stepped impedance uh, type of structure that you might see in filter design where you have a neural conductor high impedance, wide conductor low impedance, neural high, and all that kind of stuff. And um, what you can see here is uh, there is a little bit of a rounding, and it's not sharp corners as the design is showing, and I'll get onto that here in just a minute. But uh, as you're doing these measurements on a test vehicle like this, you, know, you really need to do very accurate measurements and put that back into your model and then compare your model to this and see what kind of difference you get. And um, that's really critical for using this as a test vehicle. These little conductors, the more neural conductors between the radiating patches, if they change much in width, because they are pretty narrow, if they change much in width, they can really have a pretty good impact on the impedance matching, efficiency, gain, and even bandwidth. So understanding how well these neural conductors are controlled, that's something you really do want to talk to your, talk to your fabricator about. Now, the surrounding effect I was talking about, so in design, we designed this as 90-degree corners for the inside and outside edges, and you can see on the circuit itself, it's rounded. And um, in this case, it's not too bad as I remember. I think this particular circuit had probably about a 2.8 or 3 mil uh, radius on inside and outside. And I've seen it worse than that. Now, again, at lower frequency, smaller wavelength and all that, not a big deal. Millimeter wave frequency, that can be. It depends on the design a lot, though. Uh, but I will say something about that, too. In some cases, these corners are purposely done to where you have a, a large radius or even a chamfer to get a, um, a, a, a basically a different performance out of the patch, radiant patch, you um, get a degenerate mode out of it. And with the degenerate mode is you can cause that patch to give you a different performance, which is interesting, really interesting. Actually, if you want to get more bang for the buck, you might say, or more RF performance from one patch. But if you're not trying to do that and you expect it to be square, it's not going to come out square. So you really got to keep in mind that and how much that affects your design. Again, you can put this into your model, your simulation, and see how much these radius design, and then talk to your 
uh, I'm sorry, see how much these radiuses do affect your design and then talk to your circuit fabricator and get a better understanding of what to expect for how much this can vary. Because not only are the variations nominal as shown here, it's going to have variation from one circuit to another in large volume. Uh, another thing to talk about is the trapezoidal effects, which I've mentioned several times, but this is a good comparison here on the left is the ideal cross-sectional view of a microstrip with rectangular shape conductors, and that's how most simulation uh, software is. It, they don't really account for the trapezoidal effects, and actually for several reasons. One is the trapezoidal effect is not a, a fixed issue. It varies from circuit to circuit, and it would be hard to be able to predict that. But if you talk to a circuit fabricator, they can control the circuit etching well enough to where it's either rectangular or very slightly trapezoidal. Uh, what I'm showing here on the left is rectangular, ideal on top, middle is mm, kind of moderately trapezoid, and the bottom's more trapezoid. I'm not sure if you can see that really. But basically, it's a sharper angle on these angled, slanted uh, uh, parts of the conductor. And as this shape of the conductor changes, and it could be the exact same circuit being built in large volume manufacturing, uh, that can change the RF performance of the circuit. Well, my computer's thinking. It's still thinking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, give me just a second. Let me see if I can go about this another way. Hmm. Can't seem to uh, move my slide. Do you want Do you want us to advance the slide for you, uh, John? Yes. Would you please, Gary? I'm sorry. I don't know what happened on my end. I just can't move the slides. But if you could move it to the next slide, I'd appreciate it. All right. Is that the one? Twenty-five. Um, you may not uh, see it if you've got a wonky connection. I think my connection did something funny. 24 is what it should be on. I should be showing fields of this microstrip circuit with rectangular versus trapezoidal. All right. I've got a couple that have the uh, fields. Um, okay. The first one should yep. be here's, one. Here's for... one rectangular and trapezoidal. That's so go ahead. I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure. I usually had a pretty good connection there. Now it's not behaving so well. Anyway, um, what I'm showing here is the rectangular, and this is kind of exaggerated, just so you can understand the concept, but the rectangular circuit, you can see there's a fair amount of fields uh, at the edges, left and right edges of the circuit, which is correct. And you can see there's fields in air, and that's also correct. Now, in the case of the trapezoidal shaped conductor on the bottom circuit, uh, you can see that the fields have actually shifted down, and then actually the current density has shifted down as well. So now you have less fields in error, and when you have less fields in error, that means you're going to have a higher effective dielectric constant and also increased phase angle and actually a little bit slower phase velocity. So there's several things going on there. So even as simple as this may be, um, it's actually, it can have an effect. And again, it's one of those things that millimeter wave, it can be pretty impactful at microwave, uh, not so impactful. Um, and then if I could go on to slide 25, my computer still doesn't seem to be cooperating. Okay, we're on slide 25 now. Okay, thank you very much. And give me a second. I got to switch over to something else I can look at because my computer's not being friendly. Okay, slide 25. Now I'm looking at copper thickness differences. And uh, this is normal for circuit fabrication as you go through high volume manufacturing, the same design is going to have uh, some circuits with thicker copper, some with thinner copper. And again, I'm showing differences in fields. And uh, the circuit on top would be the same design. I'm not looking at trapezoidal effects. This is just looking ideal rectangular with the thinner copper on top, thicker copper on the bottom. And the thicker copper on the bottom is going to be uh, more influenced by error because you have more fields in error. That means lower effective dielectric constant and uh, less phase angle, things like that. So that's something to consider. And uh, copper thickness variation is normal in making circuits. Uh, let me go on to slide 26 then, if you would, please. Okay. Mm, give me a second. <laughs> Sorry. 
Okay, 526. Now I want to talk about circuit um, fabrication issues related to final plated finishes. And final plated finishes is something that's necessary. You, you need to cover up the copper with something or it's going to tarnish and bad things will happen. So this is one study I did years ago where I'm comparing their copper circuits, which is the reference, and it's the light blue curve, two circuits with different finish. Emergent 10 is used a lot in uh, automotive radar at 77 gigahertz. That's the green curve. It will cause more losses. But being that it's emergent, that means the pin uh, that's being applied is extremely thin. And the variation of that very thin nickel, or, I'm sorry, very thin emergent 10 doesn't really affect the performance much. So, yes, you will get more losses with emergent 10 compared to a bare copper circuit, but it won't vary too much from circuit to circuit. As in the case of ENIG, ENIG with electrous nickel immersion gold, that nickel layer is pretty thick. And uh, considering how thin skin depths are at 77 gigahertz, ENIG can show pretty good differences with just normal uh, thickness variation of that nickel. Uh, and then the blue curves I have up there, that is the bare copper, which is the reference light blue. Another blue I kept in that color because I'm basically saying there's not a significant difference between the bare copper circuit and a circuit with OSP, which is organic solderability preservative, and then also immersion silver. Now, immersion silver might get pretty oxidized and look ugly over time, and it does, but it's actually really good for lower losses. And even the oxidized immersion silver, as bad as it looks, it really doesn't change our performance much, mainly because the, uh, the, silver is, uh, the silver oxide is almost as conductive as the silver itself. So if we could, let's go on to slide number 27. And I keep trying to do that here, but it's not letting me. I think you did. I think that one worked. Oh, really? Oh, good. It's my lucky day. Hmm. Well, you see something I don't see then, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, so We're on slide 27 now. Oh, great. Thank you. So this is the uh, comparison uh, using the exact same material, same everything. The only difference is design on the left chart, that's microstrip. On the right, that's ground to coplanar waveguide. And uh, they're using the, uh, give me a second, I can't see very well. Yep, we're using 5 mil RO3003 with rolled copper. So the bare copper curves have the least amount of insertion loss, lowest insertion loss, obviously. And then after that, I'm showing the effects of ENIG with thin nickel and thick nickel. The thin nickel is the ENIG with nickel thickness on the low side of the normal process specification and nickel on the high side. And you can see that microstrip is impacted by that, obviously, but not as much as ground to coplanar waveguide. And the reason ground to coplanar waveguide is is because you have the coplanar area where you have uh, field coupled through several layers of the plated finish. And um, that's why ground to coplanar waveguide is more impacted by final plated finish than, well, microstrip. And uh, unfortunately, ground to coplanar waveguide, in theory, is really good for a lot of millimeter wave, a lot of millimeter wave RF concerns, but ground to coplanar waveguide is more impacted by uh, circuit fabrication variables, unfortunately. Now, let me see how I do on this one. So slide you did. Eight. Oh, good. I'm glad you're seeing it because I'm not, but that's okay. <laughs> I see it. Uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, we're looking now at uh, some of the circuit material influences that can uh, they really should consider for millimeter wave. And I've given a list of different issues to look at here. And uh, one is the DK tolerance, of course. And from our experience in the industry and a lot of things we've worked with, we're sure that the DK tolerance should be uh, plus or minus 0.05 or less. And that's pretty good control of the dielectric constant. And then copper surface roughness, uh, as I've said before, that does impact insertion loss, phase angle, and all these things. So you do want to understand the copper surface roughness and have that part of your simulations and modeling. And if you don't know what the numbers are for copper surface roughness and using our materials, get a hold of us and we'll be happy to tell you. And we do have that on our technology support hub as well. And, uh, and then after that substrate thickness tolerance, um, we think the plus or minus 10% is what you should use or better. And as you go to thinner substrates, you'll find a lot of thinner substrates can't deal with that kind of tolerance. Uh, the Rogers materials most certainly does. All of our materials that are used at millimeter wave can be held to plus or minus 10% thickness tolerance or better. And then TCDK is thermal coefficient of dielectric constant. That's how much the dielectric constant changes with temperature and moisture absorption could be a concern as well. 
So let's go on to the next slide. And on to slide 29, I'm going to show a comparison. In, am I showing slide 29? <laughs> anyway, on slide 29, I'm hoping I'm showing. This is TCDK measurements. Basically, in circuit form, though, I'm showing dielectric constant on the y-axis and on the x-axis frequency uh, from 1 to 100 gigahertz. Left chart is the uh, showing differences of three different uh, environments that these circuits were tested at: 25 degrees C room temperature, 80, I'm sorry, 65 C, and 125 C room temperature. Blue curve, orange curve, 65 C, 125 C gray curve operating temperature, and you can see the difference of the dielectric constant for the circuits built on 5 mil 3003 G2 is a difference of 0.01 at 77 gigahertz. When using a competitor's PPE based material, you can see the difference is about three times that, 0.031 at 77 giga, gigahertz. So many PPE materials do have issues with the DK change in the temperature, the TCDK. Uh, we're very familiar with this for many, many years of working with this issue, and uh, all of our materials are designed to be very good and consistent for the TCDK. So let's look at moisture absorption now, and that is going to be, I'm hoping, slide number 30. And here on slide it number is. 30, oh good, uh, slide number 30 on the left, we're looking at uh, a comparison of um, basically each one of these curves, again, is extracted DK on the y-axis, x-axis is 1 to 100 gigahertz, and each one of those curves is the circuit being tested after being conditioned. The first curve is the blue curve, and that's the baseline, and that's just conditioned uh, per IPC, uh, normal room temperature, and all that kind of stuff, 50% uh, humidity. That way we know what the baseline is for humidity and how much could have been absorbed into the circuit. And then after that, we uh, subject the circuits to 85 degrees C, 85% humidity for one day. That's the red curve, three days, green curve, and on and on. And over 10 days of the subjecting these circuits to the 85C, 85% humidity, the circuits based on the 5 mil RO4830 laminate see a difference of 0.027 in dielectric constant at 77 gigahertz. The circuits based on our competitor's PPE-based material, which is higher moisture absorption, it's about 0.062. So again, a pretty big difference, double, not quite triple, but a pretty big difference. Now, not all PPE materials are bad for TCDK and moisture absorption, but it is a natural thing that has to be overcome with a good material design and formulation. So let's see if I can do this. I think I'm on slide 31 now. Yes. I'm hoping. Oh, good. Um, the, uh, this is just a quick, I just have a few minutes left because I want to have a little bit of time for questions, but this is really quickly, I'm not going to go through this, you can read this, but this is our test vehicle that we did a lot of testing on, and I want to show you those results. A very simple microstrip series fed patch antenna, and we also looked at uh, sweeping our models across what happens when you get a conductor width that varies plus or minus 0.6 mils, which is pretty common. Now, if you want a tighter tolerance for etching a conductor, you use thinner copper, such as our 9 micron RL3003 G2. That actually improves this tolerance a pretty good amount, and it depends on the fabricator again. But again, thinner copper is actually better to control the conductor with tolerance. Now, here's some uh, results of some of the testing we did. In this case, we're looking at differences due to the conductor width itself. And the conductor width, uh, varying plus or minus 0.6 mils in width, you can see what that does with the uh, the gain plots as well as the radiation plots. And for gain, that makes a difference. Um, I'm sorry, for frequency shift, it makes a difference about 550 megahertz plus or minus. And then also it makes some difference on gain as well. And then um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the phase consistency for uh, these radar circuits. And since I'm running out of time, I'll be real quick and say, Phase consistency is extremely important with series fed patch antennas, and being very consistent with phase is important. And doing the same testing I showed before in transmission lines at 25C, 65C, 125C operating temperatures, then the table in the bottom right is a summary of that. And what you see is top row RL3003G2, this is circuits made on that material, 
uh, fourth column are frequency shifts. We get very little frequency shift, and that's because this material has really very well-controlled CCDK, thermal coefficient dielectric constant. We only get 24 megahertz shift at 77 gigahertz, so that's pretty impressive. Next one down, CLTMW, that second row, then that is about 17 megahertz shift. And then down is one of the PPE competitors out of Japan, I think, not that it matters. Uh, they get about a 0.106 or 106 megahertz shift at 77 gigahertz. And you can see that's significantly different than our materials. And then uh, PPE number two, that's a Chinese-based one, and it uh, gets about 202 megahertz um, frequency shift due to operating temperature differences. So I'll leave you now with a uh, screenshot of our tech support hub, and we're very proud of this. We've got a lot of good stuff on here, a lot of calculators you can use, some you can download. We have Raj mobile apps. We also have a lot of technical papers you can get in and have more detail. Have video library, it's pretty extensive, and you can contact the engineer in your area. And I was hoping to have a little more time for questions, but we do have a few minutes, so let's give it a try. All right, so I invite any uh, viewers who have a question, type it in the Q&A chat or the Q&A box on your screen. And John, thank you. As usual, you have provided great reference material and your presentations are always chock full of data. So that's uh, not a, an easy thing to do to get the, the details that you do. So yeah. let's start with a question. Um, you showed comparisons for the 85 degrees C and 85% relative humidity uh, testing that show the DK frequency slope changes with more water vapor being absorbed. Why is that the case? Yeah, that's kind of a, a fun topic. And really what that is is water, as you know, is polar. It causes more losses, and it will change the dielectric constant. But the reason the slope changes is probably something a lot of people are not aware of, but the dielectric constant for water is high at room temperatures, like 70 or so. But actually, as you go up in frequency, it's uh, it's got dispersion, you might say, and it actually changes dielectric constant a lot. So as you go higher and higher frequency, uh, the water vapor or water itself or how it affects the dielectric constant actually changes and goes down a lot. So you get kind of a, um, a convergence, you might say, as you go higher and higher in frequency, where the dielectric constant isn't quite as high for water, but still it does make some differences. So that's kind of why you see that difference in slope. Okay, and then another question you talked about um, the PPE materials having uh, poor DC, DK, and you showed two of the materials, and they actually had very different performance uh, between the two of them. Why is there such a big difference with the same type of material? Right. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm hoping I'm showing the slide that we're talking about right now, slide 35, I'm hoping, because I don't know if my other slides indexed the way they were the last few. I apologize if that's true, but... Uh, yeah, we're on actually, slide 35. Oh, great. This slide is actually um, showing the comparison between some of our Rogers materials and the PPE-based material, and that's true. The two different PPE-based materials do have pretty big differences in performance, and uh, that really comes down to formulation. And if you were to look at a pure PPE or PPO-based material, you would find that the TCDK is not very good. The DK is going to change a lot with temperature, and you'd find the moisture absorption is not very good. But if you formulate it correct and put the right stuff in it, uh, either a microfiller or glass or certain kinds of glass, uh, you can actually vary that and have it more controlled. It's kind of like PTFE. PTFE also has a big transition at room temperature, but the RL3003 and the 3003G2 are PTFE, and there really is no transition at room temperature because you can formulate these materials um, to really get rid of some of these uh, things you don't want. And that's really the case with the PPE materials, too. You can formulate them and add things to them to uh, make them behave a little bit better with RF performance. Okay, well, we're basically out of time for questions. I think uh, some of our technical difficulties may be because you're in Germany on your way to European Microwave next week in <laughs> Milan. Correct. And so I will, I will suggest that um, you'll be at the Rogers booth, and if anyone who's watching today wants to uh, have a more detailed conversation with you, they should come by and see you in person. I like that. That's very good. Thanks. Uh-huh. 
And John, again, thank you very much. Joey, thank you as well for kicking off the uh, webinar today, and we appreciate Rogers for sponsoring it. Um, always a lot of depth and detail in these webinars, and that's critical for designers. A reminder that the webinar has been recorded and it will be available to watch in about an hour. You can find it at the events section of the Microwave Journal website under the events tab. So if any of your colleagues would find it informative, please let them know. This is certainly a hot topic, whether it's for automotive radar or some other type of millimeter wave application. And there's, as I noted, a lot of good information here. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Have a good rest of your week.